All of us. It's just cool. I use it with corn. So it's what I don't know. Well, maybe. Okay. Do the people out there know that we're starting? <laughs> Come on, all. My pleasure to introduce Ian Dark. He is the Florence Green Bixby Professor of English at UC Berkeley. He has long been my friend. I can't remember when I first met you, to tell you the truth. At Yale. Yeah. Was it? When you were at residency. And yet I have such a pleasant memory. <laughs> <laughs> And my favorite romanticist who works on the novel, Rob is now in contention. <laughs> he has two very influential books to his credit, Modern Romance and Transformations of the Novel, Cambridge, 1992, and Scott's Shadow, the novel in Romantic Edinburgh, Princeton, 2007. What caught our attention for purposes of this conference, however, is Ian's work in progress. Rob, as you know, has this curious interest in romanticism. That was one connection. But it was specifically an article on Darwin that caught my eye when I was asked to review it for publication. I wrote Ian in hopes that this article was the tip of the iceberg that there would be more of this, to discover, much to my delight, that he is now researching a study of the novel and the science of man from Buffon to Darwin. His title suggests as much, and there it is. After Natural Man, Buffon, Rousseau, Goethe, and Kant. Thank you, the loveliest introductions. I've had, um, I'm just at the risk of being redundant, reiterate the, um, in, a, in a even more effusive key, which you can take as heard, that the thanks that Amanda uh, gave both to, to Rob and Nancy for conceiving this wonderful uh, thought provoking event, um, and to Steph Stefan and Davide and everybody else who's um, been involved in making this happen. It's, it's, it's been a really incredibly uh, stimulating occasion, and I thank you all for sort of hanging on. This was great in the last session. <laughs> um, this, this is, as Nancy said, it's actually a project on the novel, but I'm actually not going to be talking about novels in this, in this talk. Um, uh, and I'm going to give you a very sort of schematic flyover or, or drive-by of a hugely complex um, genre, really, the um, philosophic, so-called philosophical anthropology or the natural history of man, as it often calls itself. This, discourse that emerges in the second half of the 18th century, and, uh, and I've been thinking about how it generates discursively the, uh, the new genres of the really consequential new forms of the novel uh, in the Romantic period, the German builders from on the one hand, and the Scottish historical novel on the other. And, and this paper is, a, is as much, this is my ongoing attempt to clarify to myself this extraordinarily interesting body of inquiry from the major figures of the late Enlightenment. Uh, this is less the biological turn, I wish you warn you, than the natural historical uh, turn, and natural history becomes a lot of a straw man, thanks perhaps, uh, in part, perhaps, no doubt, to Foucault, who weirdly elides, or all but elides, um, Buffon, uh, I'm going to talk about, talking about in the order of things, because he, I guess he was Cuvier there for this periodization right, around the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm going to talk about the, the natural historical term, if we can call it that, in late 18th century thought, or what Philip Sloan has called uh, the Buffonian Revolution. Let's see if this thing works. Uh, ah, okay. Part one. Uh, the Buffonian Revolution, 
uh, and the conversion of the Enlightenment science of man into a conjectural philosophical anthropology, natural history of man, or a history not of individuals or nations, but of the human species. Oops, hold on. Take a while to get these to the technology. Um, Buffon's Natural History, General and Particular, published from 1749 to 1788, installed the post linnaean conception of a biological species as an entity distributed in time and space, that's Sloan's phrase, rather than fixed synchronically on a taxonomic grid, realized through living organisms, faculty, and this is Buffon, translation by William Snowy, faculty of reproducing beings similar to themselves in a successive chain of individuals which constitutes the real existence of the species. The Buffonian revolution was no less critical for the human sciences, and as I'm proposing for literary genres, especially the novel, than it was for the natural sciences. Buffon instituted a zoological history of the human species, abandoned the vicissitudes of time and space, in slow summary, involving a radical historicizing and naturalizing of the science of man. The grand claims David Hume had made for the science of man that it would constitute, it says Hume, a complete system of the sciences, built on a foundation almost entirely new, were taken up by his successors. What fruitful new developments would not arise if only our whole philosophy would become anthropology, wrote Herder, projecting a history of the human soul in general by ages and peoples, the Buddhist view in his magnum opus, Ideas for a Philosophy of the History of Mankind. Herder's teacher, Kant, proposed making anthropology, quote, a proper academic discipline in order to disclose the sources of all the sciences and taught an annual anthropology course published after his retirement as anthropology from a pragmatic point of view. Kant and Herder fell out over the new anthropology in one of the great philosophical quarrels of the late Enlightenment. Reviewing the early volumes of Herder's ideas in the mid-1780s, Kant complained of the work's figurative and literary rather than properly scientific character, asking whether the poetical spirit that animates his expression has not sometimes also invaded the author's philosophy, whether here and there synony synonyms have not been allowed to count as explanations and allegories for truths, and whether in many places the fabric of bold metaphors, poetic images, mythological illusions has not served rather to conceal the body of thoughts uh, than to let it shine forth. Kant's own, uh, and you can, from Amanda's talk earlier, so you can kind of see where this is, this is going. Um, Kant's own ironical contribution to the genre of conjectural beginning of human history distinguishes between a legitimate historical method, which makes use of conjectures only to fill in evidential gaps, and a history generated simply and solely from conjectures, which is little better than the draft for a novel. It would not be able to support them of a conjectural history, but rather that of a mere fiction. The quarrel between Kant and Herder, to which I'll return in the second half of my paper, marks a persistent crux of the natural history of man, bedeviled from the start by the charge that it amounted to nothing more than conjecture, and that its exponents were in effect authors of science fiction. Uh, Dougal Stewart, who coined the English phrase conjectural history, explained that since the origins of human history lie outside verifiable knowledge, we are under a necessity of supplying the place of fact by conjecture, and must reckon in what manner human beings are likely to have proceeded from the principles of their nature and the circumstances of their external situation. Accordingly, the late Enlightenment debate on human nature came to bear on conjecture as the hinge, soft but not therefore necessarily weak, between knowledge production and mere invention. The natural historian thinks himself obliged to collect facts, not to offer conjectures. And Ferguson declares in his essay on the history of civil society, it is only in what relates to himself and in matters the most important and the most easily known that he substitutes hypothesis instead of reality and confounds the provinces of imagination and reason of poetry and science. Ferguson aims this disavowal, minimizing the margin of conjecture in his own work, at the preemptive challenge to the natural history of man issued by Rousseau in his discourse uh, on the origins of inequality among men. And the discourse is very inception. This is only uh, the uh, second discourse is published 
just one year after the treatment of human species in the fourth volume of Buffon's Natural History. Rousseau begins notoriously by setting aside all the facts, by which he primarily means a scriptural account of ancient history, and invoking hypothetical and conditional reasonings instead of historical truths, since man in the state of nature is inaccessible to any act of empirical recovery we can make from the state of civil society. The state of nature, in Paul Demand's phrase, is a radical fiction, opening, as David Bates has recently argued, the radical possibility that we were never natural. This eruption of fictionality expresses a generic instability that is endemic to what Giorgio Agamben calls the anthropological machine of enlightened knowledge. Uh, this is Agamben, an ironic apparatus that verifies the absence of nature proper to Homo, holding him suspended between a celestial and a terrestrial nature, between animal and human, and thus always less and more than himself. The delivery of man to nature and terrestrial history made it a matter of urgency to redraw the boundary of human uniqueness. Uh, Buffon himself balked at the full naturalization of the human species that his work entailed, reinstalling the division between man and nature as an internal ontological division within human nature, rebaptizing Homo sapiens as Homo duplex, split between physiological animal passions and the divinely implanted faculty of reason. Buffon's general account of what constitutes a species affords a different, although analogous, distinction, temporal distinction, between individual and species being. And this is um, Smelly, Buffon in Smelly's translation. An individual is a solitary, a detached being, has nothing in common with other beings, excepting that it resembles or rather differs from them. It is neither the number nor the collection of similar individuals but the constant succession and renovation of these individuals which constitutes the species. A being whose duration was perpetual would not make a species. Species is an abstract and general term, the meaning of which can only be apprehended by considering nature in the succession of time and in the constant destruction and renovation of beings. The transience of particular embodied lives is the necessary condition of the abstract and general life of the species. Man differs from other creatures in his capacity to reflect on and reason about this condition. Indeed, this may be the very condition of reflection of human consciousness as such, as the more radical iterations of late Enlightenment philosophical anthropology suggest, uh, such as Rousseau's whose discourse on the origins of inequality uses Buffon's distinction between individual and species being as a wedge to drive apart the constituent terms of the natural history of man, namely nature and history. In an influential redefinition, which is adopted by almost all subsequent exponents of conjectural anthropology, including Ferguson, who, whose history of society is a full point, an attempt at a full point refutation of Rousseau, um, uh, in an influential redefinition, Rousseau identifies the specific property that distinguishes man from other creatures as the faculty of perfecting oneself. This faculty, with the aid of circumstances, successively develops all the others and resides in us, in the species as well as in the individual. Whereas an animal is at the end of several months what it will be for the rest of its life, and its species is after a thousand years what it was in the first year of those thousands. History is the human condition that other creatures lack, a history doubled between the life of the individual and the life of the race or species. Rousseau converts that doubling into a radical all but ontological schism between human nature and human history, since perfectibility, it turns out, undoes the human nature it is supposed to constitute. As this is very familiar, of course, as soon as humans begin to perfect themselves, launching themselves into history by forming social groups, they quit the state of nature. Uh, the mankind of one age is not the mankind, whoops, uh, sorry, this is why those of you who don't use PowerPoint are wise to do so and go forward. Ah! <laughs> if they learn from me not to, not to, um... You can also just use the keypad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry. 
Sorry, uh, the man, this is, this is Rousseau, the mankind of one age is not the mankind of another age. The reason why Diogenes did not find a man is that he was looking among his contemporaries for the man of a time that was no more. The history of man, in short, cannot be a natural history. Not only was human nature then fractured at its foundation, as in homo duplex, so also was the discourse of a history of man, which bifurcated into rival tendencies or traditions. One, an empiricist tendency, comprising the Scottish philosophers, Herder, and ultimately Charles Darwin, and this is to override the very strong differences among these figures, just, just for now, heuristically. Um, uh, the empiricist, empiricist tendency constitutes the secular figure of man upon a principle of innate sociability, which binds together human nature and human history. Uh, we find this, you know, it's, it's kind of central principle of Charles Darwin's uh, descent in that. Uh, the other, a critical tendency, represented here by Rousseau and Kant, uh, and it's interesting to recall that um, Foucault's secondary doctoral dissertation was on Kant's anthropology, by the way, um, critical tradition, uh, rejects sociability and divides history from nature. The critical account, which Rousseau inaugurated, came first, while the empiricist account reacting to it was infected by it, making the naturalization of man a remedial and unfinished project. Hence my title, After Natural Man, which designates both the problem of belated knowledge, uh, which succeeds a phenomenon that may no longer exist, as well as uh, uh, a knowledge that chases a fugitive object, as if natural man may still be out there somewhere ahead of us and we can catch up with. Uh, in both traditions, the temporal predicament of human species being remains a crux. For the critical tradition, it remains insurmountable a fundamental structural condition of human consciousness. Human perfectibility for Rousseau and Kant entails the forging of an artificial or second nature in which man's original nature is erased and overwritten. Uh, Kant distinguishes between a physiological anthropology which investigates what nature makes of the human being and a pragmatic anthropology which investigates what man as a free acting being makes of himself or can and should make of himself. Human nature then becomes man's peculiar praxis, his work of self-invention or autopoiesis, to these terms came up in the discussion earlier this afternoon, until, this is Kant, perfect art again becomes perfect nature, which is the ultimate goal of the moral vocation of the human species. The empirical tradition claims, in contrast, an organic continuity between man's original and second nature by recourse to the progressive principle of, in Herder's phrase, a bildung der Humanität, a formation of humanity, based on the epigenetic theory of development proposed in the contemporary German life sciences. Drawing on the discoveries of Albrecht von Haller, Caspar Friedrich Wolf, and Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, Herder is the key figure in this story. Uh, as this becomes a story of a novel, and Herder is becoming a hero <laughs> of late enlightenment uh, thought for me. Um, uh, uh, the author of a biological turn in conjectural anthropology uh, that made it available for its radically empiricist rewriting the transmutationist natural history of Lamarck and Darwin, Charles Darwin. Human nature, in Herder's account, does not reside in a lost, inaccessible, effectively mythical origin but in an optative future state or teleological horizon of human history. Humanität ist der Zweck der Menschen, Natur. Humanity, the full potential of species being, is the end of human nature. Herder's chapter title admits both an actual empirical separation between humanity and human nature and their eventual convergence. Uh, in the remainder of this paper, I'll look at the debate between Kant and Herder, since it articulates, that there's the debate, it articulates with, with useful clarity what was at stake between the rival tendencies or traditions, as well as the, their protocols of representation, and signposts the forking paths of Kant's critical philosophy, on the one hand, 
and of a more determinately scientific natural history, on the other, eventually realized in Darwin's systematic digestion of the disciplines of the human sciences from anthropology to aesthetics in the descent of man. Uh, the debate was triggered by a disagreement as to whether human perfection, the full realization of human species being, could occur historically within a particular human life. In Ideas for a Philosophy of the History of Mankind, Herder argues uh, against Kant, um, who had already declared the, the contrary in his um, uh, World History from a Cosmopolitan Point of View essay, uh, Herder argues that the life of the species is imminent in each individual body. It is latent in the vital force or genetic force, Lebenskraft, genetische Kraft, that informs organic matter and joins all living beings in a continuous progressive scale. Human Bildung is the climax of a formative force or developmental drive, a Bildungsstrieb, that surges through the entire dynamic series of natural history, from the formation of the Earth to the emergence of mankind. Human emergence may have been a unique event in terrestrial history, after which the gates of creation are closed, but it was nevertheless, as John H. Zamito insists, an event within nature. The chain of improvement or cultivation, Kette der Bildung, Kette der Kultur, binding individuals and generations across time, makes history the organic medium for the realization of human species being. Every, and I'm quoting Herder in the, the Churchill Trump contemporary translation, everywhere man is what he was capable of rendering himself, what he had the will and the power to become. Uh, Kant, of course, held otherwise. If the human species signifies the whole of a series of generations going indeterminately into the infinite, and it is assumed that this series ceaselessly approximates the line of its destiny running alongside it, then no member of all the generations of humankind, but only the species, will fully reach its destiny. Perfection, which Kant posits as a universal submission to civil law within a worldwide confederation of states, is an unattainable idea. A, a, a heuristic or regulative principle, which may provide a moral purpose, but not a constitutive principle expressed in empirically demonstrable relations of cause and effect. The distinction between constitutive and regulative principles worked out in his critical philosophy, clarifies Kant's invocation of human perfectibility as a heuristic fiction, and his desire to distinguish the rigorously regulative as if, as all, that articulates teleological judgment from the loose, indiscriminate as if of mere fiction. It was Herder's invocation of the life force specifically that provoked Kant to accuse him of abandoning philosophy for fiction relying on a wishful analogy, and I'm quoting Kant here, between the natural formations of matter and an invisible universal nature that works within it and animates it, appealing to what one does not comprehend from what one comprehends even less. <laughs> Kant, too, drew on Blumenbach's uh, conception, concept of the Bildungstrieb, the organic formative drive, but for Kant, the Bildungstrieb could only be a regulative principle, bearing a heuristic rather than a mechanical efficacy in nature. Herder's habit of arguing by metaphor, instead, construes mere resemblances between species into genealogical affinities, opening the door, Kant complains, to the scandalous hypothesis of transmutation, to admit the possibility that either one species could have arisen from the other, or perhaps from a single procreative womb, would lead to ideas which are so monstrous that reason recoils before them. He adds, one may not ascribe such things to our author without doing him an injustice. <laughs> Transmutation, that is, is an inadvertent byproduct of Herder's political raptures rather than a considered hypothesis. <laughs> to be sure, Herder does not explicitly advocate the transmutation of species, at least not at the higher level. And throughout the ideas, he keeps swerving away from his arguments more heterodox implications, reasserting, for example, Buffon's appeal to divine reason as an absolute barrier between humans and the great apes. He, he very memorably evokes the pathos of the orangutans and our senses that you can't quite get to reason. <laughs> so sits there mournfully on the other side of the barrier. Uh, it turns out the achievement of humanity will take place, after all, outside the domain of natural history altogether. Uh, man alone is in a contradiction with himself and with the Earth, 
For being the most perfect of all creatures, his capacities are the farthest from being perfected, even when he attains the longest term of life before he quits the world. But the reason is evident. His state, being the last upon this earth, is the first in another sphere of existence, with respect to which he appears here as a child making his first essays. Thus, he is the representative of two worlds at once, and hence the apparent duplicity of his essence. With this philosophically weak transcendental turn, Herder wards off the spectre of a transformation of the human species within natural history. Nevertheless, Kant was not wrong to glimpse the dissolution of species boundaries in Herder's vision of an organic developmental force flowing through nature and culminating in the ascent of man. That prospect opens in Herder's rhetoric rather than in the overt logic of his argument. Kant's denunciation of poetic indulgence and figuration is provoked by his former student's equally determined, strategic rather than inadvertent commitment to the scientific efficacy of the literary stylistics. In a recent essay, Amanda Jo Goldstein, and, and she's already summarized uh, the position far more eloquently than I'm about to um, uh, rehearse, um, she argues that Herder, quote, sees poetic tropes as intrinsically linked to the physical activity of sensory experience, such that the form of representation scientifically adequate to sensory experience is figuration, image, metaphor, allegory, personification. Figuration is a technology of scientific cognition suited to the vitalist turn of late Enlightenment natural philosophy, the key terms of which the life force, the formative drive, have not yet concretized via scientific consensus into a literal technical vocabulary, and so retain their metaphoric multivalence and evocative power. Throughout Ideas for a Philosophy of the History of Mankind, Herder's writing activates what remains latent or potential in his scientific commitment, the life force. Kant took particular issue with Herder's contention that the fundamentally distinctive character of the human being, setting him apart from other animals, is a physiological one, his erect, bipedal figure. To posit reason as a functional consequence of man's operating posture is to demote it from teleological to merely etiological status. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Herder's prose enacts, as though virtually demonstrating, the metamorphosis of a lowly, groveling quadruped into a noble, upright, anthropomorphic figure. And this is a very brief, it's very hard to excerpt Herder's writing, it's a wonderful, <laughs> turbulent, rhapsodic <laughs> manner. Uh, like, uh, 18th century German Ruskin. <laughs> Look up to heaven, O oh man, and tremblingly rejoice at thy vast superiority to the creator of the world is connected with such a simple principle thy upright form. The fashioning thy limbs to an erect posture has given thy head its beautiful outline and position, whence the brain, that delicate ethereal germ of heaven, has full room to extend itself and send out its branches. The forex swells rich in thought. The animal organs recede. It is the form of a man. As the skull rises higher, the ear is seated lower. It becomes more closely connected with the eye, and the two senses have more intimate access to the sacred apartment in China. Uh, it would not be long before natural philosophers mobilized organic development to erode the grounds of human exceptionality. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's zoological philosophy, adopting Buffon's and Herder's organic scale two decades later, fully submerges man in the tides of terrestrial life, comprising the interaction of an organic progressive drive with geographical constraints and opportunities, such that the human form, like all natural forms, is open, malleable, shaped by environmental pressure, and reciprocally self-shaping through heritable habit. Extending Rousseau's orangutan hypothesis of the identity of natural man and defying Herder's bar against the creature's access to humanity, Lamarck rehearses, uh, very famously, notoriously, the scenario of a quadrumanous animal that descends from the trees and strives following an innate cognitive drive to walk upright. If the individuals of which I speak were impelled by the desire to command a large and distant view, and hence endeavor to stand upright, and continually adapted that habit from generation to generation, there is again no doubt that their feet would gradually acquire a shape suitable for supporting them, an erect attitude. There is again no doubt that their facial angle would become larger, that their snout would shorten more and more, and that finally it would be entirely effaced so that their incisor teeth became vertical. It takes little more than a grammatical shift to the hypothetical as if 
to convert her as hortatory evocation of the ascent of man into a conjectural evolutionary history. Once it is understood to pervade the entire system of nature, the very condition that set man apart from the other creatures, his developmental capacity, his plasticity, perfectibility, now dissolves the vaunted permanence and uniqueness of human nature. The countercharge of conjecture would come from Charles Lyell, who inserted a detailed refutation of Lamarck in the second volume of Principles of Geology, uh, thereby, of course, ensuring its wide English readership, because um, uh, zoological philosophy was actually not translated into English until the 20th century. Uh, somewhat as Thomas Reed's confutation of Hume's treatise actually gained it a much larger readership than it otherwise would have had if bothered to uh, try and refute it. Uh, in proposing the transformation of species, Lyle complained, Lamarck gives us names for things, and with a disregard to the strict rules of induction, resorts to fictions as ideal as for plastic virtue and other phantoms of the Middle Ages. One of Lyle's more attentive readers was, of course, Charles Darwin, who read Principles of Geology on the Voyage of the Beagle. Kant's critical reason may have won the local engagement by virtue of superior philosophical rigor, but heard as leap into science fiction, charging the natural history of man with a biological drive, would seem to have won the war. Thank you. <laughs>